it's not as inclusive as we'd like it to be from a number of dimensions. And one of them is that we must recognize that a very small minority of Muslims engage in the commercial Islamic finance sector, be that having an Islamic bank account or investing in an Islamic fund or subscribing to a sukuk. The social finance elements, of course, are very strongly linked to the sustainable development goals. And these 17 goals would be familiar to many of you who are uh, attentive to development finance. And one of the, the projects we're undertaking and looking at at UNDP is when we look at Islamic social finance and Islamic finance broadly, how does it serve each of these goals? And I'm very pleased to say that when we look at the legacy uh, of Islamic finance and taking, for example, the waqf sector, the endowment sector, you'll find endowments for each of these or many of these goals. So you'll find endowments, many endowments that address hunger by feeding people. You'll find countless endowments that address education by educating people. You'll find endowments pertaining to health care uh, and so on and so forth. So we find that in the Islamic finance tradition, there's a great deal of SDG alignment already in place. Uh, and so that is something that Islamic finance can look at as, as something in its heritage that is very important, has made contributions to the world, and as we move forward uh, in financing the SDGs, uh, Islamic finance certainly has something to offer. Uh, this opportunity can be very compelling uh, if we do these three things. Number one, I believe it's important that we expand our understanding of Islamic finance to include not only the commercial sector, but also the social finance side. The Islamic Development Bank estimates it can be as much as one trillion per year in zakah alone. Uh, we need to build uh, or recognize the linkages that we have inherently between Islamic finance and sustainable development. Uh, as mentioned, the waqf sector is one example. Uh, zakah, of course, has a lot of impact for social development. And even the, in the private sector work we do, the Islamic finance sector is much more aware and attuned to its principles and values and social impact. Uh, than many in the private sector, and that is the strength of Islamic finance. Uh, and finally, it's important to work on identifying and measuring SDG impact. It's a field that has experts in it. It's something that the Islamic finance community can benefit from uh, and adopt and integrate, and in doing so, will demonstrate its relevance to these global goals that are being serviced across the globe. Um. So most of the companies I work with now really are, are, are addressing the gap, and I think Amir touched, you know, brilliantly on this. Really, you know, two trillion in assets, which is less than one percent of global uh, banking assets, a population that's almost twenty-five percent of the global population. And, uh, you know, and on the previous panel as well, it was discussed that you know if you look at the one point seven billion people unbanked in the world, which are the World Bank stats, about seventy percent of those are in Muslim countries. One of the first things when it came to Islamic fintech was. It became a thing a few years ago and um, nobody really knew how many companies were out there, which ones were Sharia compliant, which ones uh, marketed themselves as being Sharia compliant, which ones were inherently Sharia compliant. There wasn't even a definition around it. So part of the work that we did was really to landscape uh, the Islamic f fintech firms around the world uh, and really trying to address some of the common problems that uh, those firms have. And they have many of the same problems that a lot of early stage tech businesses have, but they tend to be exacerbated by the fact that they um, that they're seen as Sharia compliant. They're, always, they're almost seen as niche and not mass market, which is completely, the, completely untrue because they are set up from scratch to be mass market uh, and, and solution led. Technology in, in this instance to me is the, is the enabler to get to the consumer that you're looking to target. Um, there is, I come from a Western market, um, as do you. There, there are many more ethically minded investors that are looking for opportunities. Yet, there are very few IFAs or in the UK or um, you know, um, uh, advisors in the US that will provide sustainable ethical investments um, as a service. Um, we've done an analysis uh, on the public equity asset class, which is the asset class where everyone can access to its data. Uh, over the past 10 years, since 2007 to 2017, we looked into different indices and we compared the Sharia compliant, what we call prudent ethical investing performance versus unrestricted versus responsible only. And it was quite evident that prudent ethical investing, the Sharia compliant indices, uh, not only reduced the risk, risk but also improved the risk adjusted return of portfolios. 
during and after the crisis. And it is quite evident that such kind of investing, prudent ethical investing investment would uh, expose portfolios or would bias portfolios to factor exposures like growth and quality, as, as I said. What we really saw that you know, poverty cannot thrive in a correctly implemented Isla Islamic financial system because the system will not fail the poor. The poor will always be attended to and there would always be a fair distribution of wealth in society. But despite all the wealth accumulated in Muslim and Western countries alike, and after trillions of dollars in philanthropy, we're, we're, we're suffering from you know, one of the biggest moral crises of our time, which is global poverty. Um, with two billion people living on less than two dollars and fifty cents a day. I also think it's important to celebrate and recognize the origins uh, of the ethical system uh, that informs uh, Islamic finance. And you know, I, I like to look at a waqf as the original mechanism for sustainable development goals. Literally, sustainable because a waqf has to be permanent. That's what to make to be a waqf it has to be permanent asset. So it's sustainable. Development because it has to serve a social purpose to be a waqf and goal oriented because in a waqf it's very clearly defined what the objectives are and they have to be serviced in perpetuity. Um, and then beyond that, I think it's I think I don't think the solution necessarily lies with Islamic banking. I think I think it's a new wave of entrepreneurs that can address most of these um, problems that exist within the economy and help address alleviate some of the the, the stress that exists in terms of. Um, many people that are living in poverty right now.